My name is Micah Ziegler. I am an assistant professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering and in the School of Public Policy. I have been here all of um, two and a half months since January 1st. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank you for attending, the online attendees, the people watching this video later. Um, so yeah, I arrived at Georgia Tech in January of this year. And today I kind of wanted to introduce a bit of my research, uh, basically my research objectives and provide a few examples of my research from my previous work to kind of provide a sense as to what I plan to accomplish here. Uh, and of course, if anything interests you, the folks who are listening online, I'm of course open to collaborations and have research opportunities available for students who might be interested. Um, so in this talk, I plan to discuss how we can accelerate the improvement of technologies that could help us mitigate climate change. And I'm going to describe quantitative insights that can improve decision making when people design new technologies and decide what to research, as well as when people craft public policies and uh, choose how to allocate investments. And in particular, I'm going to describe the research I've done on energy storage technologies over the past couple of years and demonstrate how this research fits into a broader effort to reach our sustainability goals. So before you start, in yeah. terms of background, it's interesting to have, you know, chemistry and public policy joint appointment. So what, what was your trajectory? Sure. Yeah, I'll give a little bit about my background. Um, many years ago, as in this undergraduate student, I really wanted to have an environmental impact. Like, that's why I went to college. When I did college visiting days, I wanted to figure out who had the best environmental studies program, because that's what I was planning on doing, and then going to law school. Um, oh, going to law school. That was, that was yeah, environmental law. Yeah. Um, and over time, I, you know, I found an interest and nurtured an interest in science. Um, professors also commented on my interest in science. and. Uh, a number said, you know, you can always go from science to policy. It's harder to go back from policy to science. And there, they, you need more scientists and engineers informing policy discussions. I was told that by professors wow, back in 2005 at this point. Um, and so I kind of switched from environmental studies to chemistry um, because I was really interested in the science that underlies a lot of the potential solutions to energy and environmental problems. Um, and so I pursued that through my undergraduate career, and then I uh, was a lead scholar. I did environmental work in China, and then I worked at the World Resources Institute in DC for a couple years, and then was still What's considering- your portfolio? What? What was your portfolio then? Um, there I was working in climate and energy policy. So a, a big part of what I did there was um, I worked on studying international climate negotiations and trying to see how they could make more progress. And actually, one of the biggest the biggest pieces of the work I did there was studying uh, how other international negotiating regimes got to some levels of success. Right? You know, nuclear nonproliferation, other arms, of, you know, uh, agreements, and World Trade Organization and economic agreements. How did they work out some of these thorny collective action type problems? And could we then translate those lessons for use in climate negotiations? So I did that type of work, and I also got involved in community engagement around carbon dioxide capture and storage, um, electricity transmission policy, and uh, of course analyzing legislation that was before Congress at the time. So you know this is when there was cap and trade being considered by the Congress. Um, so 2000. The power of dream. It seems like now. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a different approach to environmental policy. So I did that, and I was still considering law school, but then. I looked around and was like, many of the people at the, uh, you know, in the upper role, like levels of these think tanks and nonprofits, we have lots of fantastic environmental lawyers and and some really great, like you know, atmospheric scientists who really understood climate change inside and out. So I'm like, what can I contribute that's different that can add value? And I went and got a PhD in chemistry to study again, like those technologies that might help us solve environmental issues. And then by the end of my PhD, I, you know, I studied artificial photosynthesis and chemical catalysis, and I then became very interested in questions as to why some technologies succeed and others don't. Um, you know, what enables solar photovoltaics to be on the rooftops of houses, whereas an artificial leaf, which we can make in the lab, isn't. Um, and so I became very interested in those types of questions, and then pursued that in postdoctoral research at MIT. Um, so that's how I ended up here. 
Was um, that in the policy department, or was it were we, you co-advised, or how? When was you at the MIT? Yeah, it was in the Institute for Data Systems and Society. I worked with Jessica Transit um, there, the, studying essentially energy systems and technological change. Um, so, what are we? And it, a lot of what I did there informs the, the outline of the research that I'm going to describe. Where, you know, it's how can we understand these technologies and how can we improve them? Yeah. But yeah, it was in a it was in a pathway. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We're delighted to have you here at Georgia Tech. So I'm, why did you pick Georgia Tech? <laughs> great question. Um, many many reasons. One of the big reasons was there was an acceptance of who I was and the type of research I want to do. Um, I had asked many departments about how they handle joint appointments, for example. And here, I didn't need to ask. I was told multiple times in my first day of my on-site interview, right before I was hired, right when they were interviewing me, multiple faculty members had within the day said, have you considered a joint appointment? Like, we do a lot of those here. Um, there was an encouragement for the type of research I want to do and the, you know, the experience, like, I guess, institutionally with how that can be managed in a university context. That's wonderful to hear about Georgia Tech. Yeah. <laughs> so your uh, interviews were in a wide variety CHBE of departments. or here? I would in, oh, here I was interviewed primarily in CHBE and then, and then, then we reached out to public policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So yeah, um, so uh, to, you know, Give you a sense of what I want to talk about. I want to provide some motivation and overview about the type of work that I do um, and describe how this research fits into a broader context. And then I want to provide two research examples that fit into this context. Uh, the first in which we uh, essentially involves modeling systems that integrate intermittent renewable resources with storage. And in the second line of research, investigating determinants of technological change. So I'll start with how I motivate and, uh, and organize the work that I do, which is really how I plan to help society reach environmental goals. So I have a pragmatic data informed approach. It includes these five steps. And the premise of this approach is that we have limited time and limited resources uh, to reach our environmental goals and we'll need to improve how we spend that time and how we spend those resources if we're going to avoid still worse possible impacts of climate change and other environmental issues. This is the general approach that describes just one way in which research can have an impact, and it's also a shared approach. I'm obviously not doing this work alone. Um, the research that I do along with others it, it involves the first three steps of this cycle. In the first step, we're trying to understand what we want from technologies in context. So here we're trying to determine how technologies might need to operate to help society achieve its energy, environmental, economic, and social goals and how what we require of these technologies might change over time and in space. So we often are starting at the systems level and we're using models and simulations to study the systems in which these technologies might operate and we can use our results to identify challenges and opportunities and sometimes set quantitative performance targets. Then in the next step, we want to identify features of technologies that could reach these performance targets. A technology feature could, for example, be having very high energy efficiency or very low greenhouse gas emissions for every kilowatt hour of electricity produced. And I want to highlight here that we're identifying features of technologies and not specific technologies. We're striving to be technology agnostic, and this is because sometimes there's considerable uncertainty as to how a given technology might or might not improve. And it can be more prudent to identify features that could describe different technology options or different classes of technology. And then in the third step, we're aimed to investigate strategies to improve and deploy technologies with the focus on the features we identified in that second step. So this is where we can identify actionable insights that can improve specific technologies or classes of technologies. Let's say we want to bring down the cost of an energy technology. Here we're asking what can help us do that most effectively given our limited time and resources. Do we just need more research and development? If so, what type of research and development do we need? Where should it be directed? Or do we need to scale up manufacturing, benefit from economies of scale? In this step, we're seeking to determine how we can use the tools we have to uh, help technologies reach the targets that we set. 
Next, the strategies we've identified need to be implemented by decision makers across society. Those involved in R&D, in policy making, in directing investments, both public and private. We're trying to inform their decisions so that their efforts can help accelerate the improvement of sustainable technologies. Finally, technologies will change, and at the same time, our objectives for those technologies might change. And of course, the world changes, ideally for the better. And in a few cases, everything changes enough that we have to come back to reevaluate re to make sure that we're still on track to reaching our goals. And so this approach basically encapsulates both my research efforts and how they're directed, um, the impacts that I hope them to have. Um, and so I would like to briefly describe some research that fits into this essentially cycle. Uh, and I'll start with some research that my colleagues and I undertook to understand some of the challenges facing energy storage technologies. And in this work, we develop our understanding by modeling renewable energy systems of storage. And so with this example, I'm going to describe research that addresses the first two steps of the cycle. And we start by examining the essentially engineering and policy challenge that we face. On the top of the slide, I'm just showing one month of solar and wind energy resources in Massachusetts. Solar is in green, wind is in blue. Um, on the bottom, we have electricity demand for the New England region. And our challenge is to shape the renewable supply so that it meets the demand. And many technologies can help us do this, energy storage, backup power, expanding transmission. Meanwhile, we can think of demand side management as helping shape the bottom, bottom profile to better match the top. So in this work, my colleagues and I wanted to examine the role of energy storage and investigate how it can enable the integration of high percentages of intermittent resources into a reliable electricity grid. And by studying these systems, we are gonna try to answer a few key questions. The first question is, which features of energy storage should we focus on? For example, to address this challenge, does energy storage need to be very energy efficient? Does it need to have very high power capacity? Are low cost the overriding feature? And then the second key question is explanatory. What determines the characteristics of systems that can address this challenge? What are the underlying drivers? So let's first discuss how we model these systems. And to study them, we are using a parsimonious energy system model. We obtained 20 years of hourly data on historical solar irradiance and wind speeds, and we estimate how much electric power would have been available every hour of the day for two decades. And we do this for different locations that represent different combinations of high and low solar and wind resource potential. So in this initial work, we looked at Arizona, Iowa, Massachusetts, and Texas. And then we define our storage system and we're defining it. We're using a technology agnostic model so that we can study a wide variety of both existing and potential future storage technologies. So we look at a range of power and energy capacities and we allow the power and duration of these storage systems to scale separately. And we examine a wide range of costs of this power and energy capacity. And then we also want, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, on that, that sure. column, uh, is it based on the existing uh, renewable <clears throat> energy generation capacity or is it a hypothetical? Um... Hypothetical. We say if, if installing more solar and wind will help us re help us achieve our goals, we'll let it do that. So we're, we are not constraining it with existing solar and wind power capacity. And the goal comes from? I mean, the, like the objective, we'll get there. Okay. Yeah, um, because we essentially the goal comes from having to meet these demand profiles. Okay. Um, we examine different output profiles that we could possibly produce using renewables and storage. And in this work, we actually uh, specifically model profiles that reflect traditional grid roles. Like we have a base load profile, a peaker profile, an intermediate profile, and then also a bi peaker profile that might be more important going forward. Uh, and so then using the data that we have and the model storage and these output profiles and a whole lot of computer processors, um, we identify systems that provide electricity reliably using solar, wind, and storage and minimize the cost of providing this electricity. So we're doing a cost minimization to identify essentially systems that are provide electricity with the lowest possible cost. Yeah. Are you just trying to meet the demand with renewables? You don't have anything else contributing? 
we, we do in this study allow for other technologies. But again, because we're, we are focusing on the renewables and storage, we essentially have a way of summarizing the role of those other technologies with a single variable. Um, so we can say, you know, what if we don't expect as much from renewables and storage? And whatever fills in the gap could be it could be natural gas with CCS, it could be expanded transmission, it could be any number of things. But we we wanted to make the model, you know, to focus on what we were interested in, and then that part is basically abstracted. Um, I won't be talking too much about the results from that extraction, um, but I'll briefly mention them. Uh, but here, here's a big piece of the results. Here I'm plotting the cost of providing this electricity from renewables and storage uh, for the four locations and the four output profiles. And we call this the levelized cost of shaped electricity because we're shaping that renewable energy into one of those output profiles. And we examined how this cost of electricity depends on the cost power capacity cost of storage plotted along the y axis here and the energy capacity cost of storage plotted along the x axis and these are two important technology features of energy storage and th these costs are just for systems that rely on the least cost mix of solar and wind power capacity so we're mixing solar and wind here and these results demonstrate that for a range of costs that reflect currently available storage technologies the cost of electricity depends more on the cost of storage energy capacity to get along the x-axis than it does on the cost of power capacity plotted along the y-axis. Basically, for a given change along the x-axis, you see a bigger change in the levelized cost of shaped electricity than you do for moving along the, the y-axis. So the x-axis, we see more change. <coughs> And so these results kind of tell us that if we have a given technology with a very low cost of energy capacity, then the high, a high cost of power capacity might not be very problematic, which is potentially promising for electrochemical options and technologies like electrolyzers and fuel cells, where the electrolyzers and fuel cells might have a high cost of power capacity, but the cost of storing hydrogen in an underground cavern could be very low, right? We can also, in this analysis, compare the cost estimate that we have to the cost of electricity produced by traditional generation technologies, like natural gas, with um, advanced nuclear, you know, advanced coal with some CCS. And through this comparison, we can develop targets for energy storage systems to enable the production of cost competitive electricity from renewables. And we find that if one expects renewables and storage to provide cost competitive electricity 100% of the time, every hour of the day for 20 years, then the cost of storage energy capacity, which we found to be the more important of these two features, needs to be less than $20 per kilowatt hour, often in the range of five to $15 per kilowatt hour. But things get interesting at $20 and we also found, however, if we relax that reliability requirement, if we let other technologies come in and play a role just 5% of the time, then in that case, the target for the cost of storage energy capacity rises dramatically, nonlinearly, to $150 per kilowatt hour. So in this work, we also examined how these systems would need to operate to ensure that there is this reliable supply of energy. And so here I plotted, for example, yes, question. Before you move on, and yeah. what is the storage capacity cost today? It depends on which technology, technology you're looking at. Yeah. Um, you know, and so that 20 to 150, please put it in context sure. for me. Um, for us. It depends heavily on the storage technology. There are some companies which are targeting $20 per kilowatt hour for, um, for those technologies are still being developed and being demonstrated. Um, you have lithium ion batteries where pack level costs, not fully installed costs, pack level costs for stationary storage are coming in in the low 100, like 1 to 1 maybe. The fully installed costs tend to be higher. But they're now quoting cell level costs, right? You know, get a smaller component, but cell level costs of lithium iron phosphate batteries in China are being quoted in the 50 to 70 dollar per kilowatt hour range. This is a moving target for many of these storage technologies. Um, pumped hydroelectric facilities will often have low cost of storage energy capacity, like near $20 per kilowatt hour, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. 
Um, but then really high cost of power capacity, like a thousand dollars per kilowatt, because the turbines and the pumps can be expensive. Um, but again, all of this is changing, right? You know, building new pumped hydroelectric facilities can be difficult. You would have to purchase land that someone probably has valued for some other purpose, especially in you know certain countries. Um, but you know, and battery targets are you know battery costs are a moving target. Every couple months, we have a new you know a new low basically. So it's hard to provide an exact value. Um, so in, in this, we studied, you know, how they would have to operate. Like, what is the state of charge of the storage system, which I'm showing here for systems in Iowa that have to meet a baseload output profile 100% of the time. And we basically found that for most of the time, storage is relatively full. But we also identified these infrequent but severe shortage events that occur just a few times a decade, maybe even less than that. And these are the events that at very high levels of reliance on renewables and storage drive the size of storage and renewables required and are in turn heavily influencing that cost of level life. Here are the drivers. And so based on this research, we arrived at some insights that can already inform the design of new technologies. So for energy storage technologies, we found the cost of shaping renewables are more sensitive to the cost of storage energy capacity than power capacity for costs that reflect a range of currently existing energy storage technologies. And so one implication of this is that we want to focus on reducing the cost of uh, storage energy capacity to less than $20 per kilowatt hour. And this target has already served as a target for people developing new technologies. And also there have been efforts to further refine this type of target in uh, systems. And then we also found that there are these infrequent severe shortages in renewables that drive storage requirements when you're very heavily dependent on those renewables and storage. And one implication of this is that new strategies should focus on mitigating these severe shortages. So, of course, the implication then can lead to new research questions. And so we're going to take one of these objectives and try to figure out how we can enable, ideally accelerate technological improvement in that direction. So we're going to focus on how we can reduce the cost of storage energy capacity. And so this takes us to the second research example in which we're going to investigate the determinants, the factors that lead to rapid technological change for storage technologies. And we're moving on to the third step in the cycle, where with the focus on the technology future, we identify those energy capacity costs for storage. We're going to try to investigate and develop strategies to improve and deploy technologies. And so in this, we're really trying to understand why technologies change so we can inform these strategies to enable or accelerate the improvement of technologies. And so at this point, we do need to pick a technology. We're not going to pick a technology to go out and advocate for. We're going to pick a technology to study to understand how these costs of storage change over time. We have many storage technologies we can choose from, pumped hydroelectric, compressed air energy storage, but we're going to focus on batteries more specifically lithium ion batteries, because they're very relevant to the electrification of transportation, and they're increasingly being deployed in stationary applications. So what can we learn from lithium ion batteries? Well, on the top of this slide, I'm showing a visual progression of the improvement of these batteries over time, from a test tube cell in 1983 to some of the first commercially produced cells in 1991, to a large stationary facility in 2018. They're all lithium ion storage technologies. They appear to be improving quickly, if you look at the photos at least, but the first question is how quickly have they actually improved? Are they actually a good model to study if what we want to learn is how to rapidly improve battery technology? And then if they are a good model to study, if they have improved rapidly, then what factors led to the improvement of lithium ion batteries? And what lessons can we learn from that? And then thinking toward the future, how can we enable further improvement for storage technologies? What should researchers and policymakers and investors do? So we're gonna, I'm going to describe some work in which we use empirical data and explanatory models to answer these questions, starting with the first, how rapidly have lithium ion batteries actually improved? So we found that lithium ion batteries have fallen in price dramatically since their commercial introduction. Specifically, the cost of lithium ion cells fell by 97% uh, in just under three decades, from 1991 to 2018. Uh, 
And we determined this by collecting and harmonizing all of the empirical data we could from a variety of disparate sources. And using these data, we developed representative price series, uh, which I plotted here in orange for all types of cells and in blue just for cylindrical cells. Um, <clears throat> and then we can measure price decline. But the price of energy capacity, that dollars per kilowatt, which I'm plotting on the y, the logarithmic y-axis here, is not necessarily, is not the only important feature of lithium-ion batteries. It's not even necessarily the most important feature. Uh, lithium-ion batteries weren't originally adopted because they were the least expensive rechargeable battery at the time. They were adopted because they allowed someone to hold a camcorder in the palm of their hand. That's what they were originally being developed for. They were adopted because they stored a lot of energy in a limited volume. They have high energy density. And so in this work, we wanted to also get a sense, a more holistic sense, as to how rapidly these batteries improved in performance. So we examined how their energy density improved over time. Again, we relied on lots of empirical data. We found that the energy density of lithium ion cells increased more than threefold between 1991 and the early 2010s from just about 200 to over 700 watt hours per liter with a bit of leveling off since then. But at this point, you might be wondering, okay, how do we know if these changes are actually rapid? Right? I'm just saying that where they've gone. Uh, the question that we really are trying to answer there is compared to what? How rapid are these changes compared to changes observed for other technologies? And we can make that comparison. Here I'm comparing the rates of improvement for lithium ion batteries to the rates measured for other technologies. On the left, I'm plotting rates of improvement or of cost or price decline versus time. And on the right, I'm plotting rates of cost decline versus cumulative production. These are another common way to measure improvement in technologies. We call them learning rates often. Uh, and the dotted lines vertically are the rates that we measured for lithium ion batteries. And the multiple colored histograms at the bottom are rates measured for uh, essentially technologies and in under other industries and in chemical, hardware, energy, and other industries. And we see that versus time, when we just look at price decline, the decrease in dollars per kilowatt hour, lithium ion batteries have improved more rapidly than many other technologies. But versus cumulative production, the learning rate, they're kind of towards the middle top of energy technologies and the middle bottom of chemical technologies. But when we consider the decline in price and the increase in energy density, the improvement rates we measure increase substantially. We now find that lithium ion batteries have improved much more rapidly than many other technologies versus time, and their improvement versus cumulative production is now near the top of energy technologies and the middle top of chemical technologies. So in this work, we were able to reliably measure the improvement rates for lithium ion batteries and consider how they improved along multiple dimensions. And we find that the rate of improvement of lithium ion batteries is comparable to that of solar photovoltaics, which is often held up as a prime example of a rapidly improving clean energy technology. So now we want to know why did this happen? What enabled that rapid cost decline and what lesson can we learn? So we undertook another study. And to do this, we have to employ a mechanistic explanatory modeling approach. This approach is dynamic. It considers how technologies change over time, and it's bottom up. It reflects the underlying engineering of the technology. As it's a relatively newer approach, I'll briefly introduce it. We start with the cost model or a cost equation of a technology, which connects the overall device cost to the underlying engineering. So on the top right hand side of this slide, I'm showing the cost equation that a few colleagues of mine uh, developed a couple years ago for solar photovoltaic modules, where the cost of the module in dollars per watt is given as a function of several variables, like the energy efficiency of the module, the price of the silicon, the size of the manufacturing plants. And the amount of detail that goes into one of these equations reflects the data availability and the importance of these different variables. With one of these, we can then derive cost change equations, which, with which we can quantify how change in a given variable contributes to changing costs of the technology over time. Now, for those of you thinking through the math, we can't follow technologies continuously through time. So we have to use an approximation because we have to compare changes between discrete time points. But one major advantage of this approach, one thing that makes that approximation worth it, is that with this approach, we can disentangle the impacts of multiple simultaneous changes to a technology when those changes occur in a non-additive fashion. So you might have heard people talk about the reasons why solar photovoltaics came down in time over in cost over time. 
some people point to that increase in energy efficiency. They're like, it's a big success of R&D efforts. Is energy efficiency increased and increased in that brought down cost? Other people say, well, the decrease in polysilicon was the driver. It's a spillover from the semiconductor industry. And so other people are like, well, no, there are these big manufacturing plants that were built, and it's the economies of scale. Well, all of those things happened, as well as other things, and they happened in overlapping periods of time. And they don't have necessarily additive contributions to that cost. With this approach, we can disentangle and quantify those contributions. Also, having a cost equation, another advantage is you lower the chance of double counting something. And this approach can be used retrospectively and prospectively. <clears throat> so I'm going to describe a retrospective analysis to understand why lithium-ion batteries came down in cost so rapidly. But before that, I want to make sure we're all on the same page as to what goes into a lithium-ion battery. I'm showing a very simplified diagram of a sealed electrochemical cell on the right-hand side of this slide. On the left-hand side of the diagram, we have the cathode and lithium-ion battery. This is typically a lithium metal oxide, the classic example of lithium cobalt oxide. But over the years, researchers found ways to replace that cobalt with different mixtures of nickel and the manganese and cobalt. We can also just use lithium iron phosphate entirely. Um, on the right hand side, we have an the anode. This is typically graphite, so it's sheets of carbon. And when you charge your lithium ion battery, the lithium ions migrate and sit between these sheets. Now, they can't migrate near a vacuum, they need some help. And that help comes in the form of an electrolyte, typically something like lithium hexafluoride phosphate dissolved in a mixture of organic carbonates. And then we also have current collectors, aluminum and copper foil, um, to let the electrons move back and forth. And of course, if the cathode and anode touch, that's a short circuit. We don't want that. We have to keep them apart with something we call a separator, uh, which is typically polyethylene or polypropylene, uh, basically a sheet of plastic. And so given this information, as well as much more information as to what goes into these batteries beyond the simplified diagram, we can then develop a cost model for lithium ion cells. Uh, I'm showing you the cost model we developed here. We have different sections for the cathode and the anode. And at first glance, this might just appear to be simple accounting. But that's not the case. In here, what we're really trying to do is, we're rather than just adding the cost of every component, we're identifying and disentangling the variables that were that reflect the objectives of research and development and the impacts of changes to manufacturing. Notably, for example, some important variables are ratios that influence multiple uh, portions of this cost equation. Um, so, for example, rather than focusing on the mass of capital material we have to add to a battery, what we instead focus on is the specific capacity of that capital material, the amount of charge that can be held in a given gram. And so the variables in this equation reflect the underlying chemistry, engineering, physics of these devices. And so we need to use those cost change equations to quantitatively disentangle those components. We also want to control for changes that were introduced to make batteries suitable for new applications, like for use in electric vehicles or power tools. So it, through this study, we only looked at cells that were really designed to have as much energy as possible in a limited volume, to have a high energy density. And we controlled for the size and shape of these battery cells. And so given these controls, changes in these variables are what we refer to as the low level mechanisms of cost change. They are the mechanisms through which the cost of these batteries came down over time. But of course, to make this analysis come alive, we need to go beyond an equation on the slide. We need lots of data to populate it. So we undertook an immense data collection effort. We collected data from articles, corporate reports, legal filings, industry studies, government reports, specification sheets. We have over 1,000 records, over 15,000 qualitative and quantitative data points from just about 280 references. On the right here, I'm plotting the data that we collected for just one of the 41 variables in that cost equation. This is the cost of the, the cathode material over time. You can see that it has decreased over time. It's also diversified as more cathode materials were being introduced. And you might also notice I've highlighted two time periods on this plot. And that's because we are going to compare cells, a representative cell from the late 1990s to a representative cell from the early 2010s. We have to compare between discrete time points because we can't follow this continuously in time. And so within each one of these two periods, we develop a representative value. I plotted it here at these horizontal solid lines. And we also get a sense of our uncertainty in the data with these upper and lower bounds, these four dashed horizontal lines. 
And so given these data and similar data for the other 40 variables, we then quantify the contribution of those low level mechanisms of cost change. So I've aggregated the contributions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, something on that yeah. methodology. So Absolutely. if you go to this graph, so <coughs> the first time period versus the second time period, yeah. there's a decrease. Um, is there a correspondence? In other words, is it do you have one technology that is carried over time, or is there kind of jump discontinuities because you have new technologies? Um, and then how do you handle that in the estimation extrapolation? So by comparing between discrete time points, we avoid having to know what happens here. But of course, we want to know kind of what happens. We want to make sure our, our results are robust. You know, you have a bit of both, right? You have cathode material from the second time period that were being examined that weren't being considered in the first time period. So you can kind of consider that a jump, or you consider that just an improvement on the cathode material. It depends at what level of resolution you're examining. Do you care about the chemical composition or just the performance of that material? Um, and so, but really, by looking at the representative periods, we kind of can look at the change over time, and there might have been many things operating in between. Um, but you know, saying whether it was a jump or a smooth pattern. Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't yeah. really thinking of the, in between being the jump. It was that the cost might of something might suddenly jump down because a new material was um, introduced. Yeah. And so by looking at those, these two time periods, you are also, I assume, wanting to project into the future. Or not, not necessarily in the study. Projecting um, into the future requires kind of actually a reformulation of the model. So this model was designed in part to work with the historical data we have and to understand those trends. If I were more, if I wanted to say something about a perspective analysis, I would actually use a different type. A, 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 I could use a similar approach, but a different type of model, and I would have to populate it differently. Yeah. Okay. I assumed. I think I assumed because you were looking at trends that the primary purpose of doing that was to project into the future. Here That's I'm not coming from. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to do a quantitative projection here. Mm -hmm. Here I'm trying to understand why the technology improves so rapidly, mm -hmm. learn something from that, and that something might be somewhat qualitative, somewhat quantitative, and then use that information to change what we can do into the future, to inform the decisions we make. Okay. Thanks. So these are the low-level mechanisms mm -hmm. of cost change. I've aggregated those 41 variables. And we found, for example, that the largest contribution to cost change between the late 1990s and the early 2010s was actually the increase in cell charge density, which contributed 38% of the cost reduction observed. The next largest contribution, 18%, came from the decrease in the price of the cathode material. And then the third largest contribution, 14%, came from the increase in the size of the manufacturing plant and the decrease in the associated costs. But we also see significant, albeit smaller, contributions from a variety of other changes. Now, of course, these are discrete bars. We wanted to get a sense of the uncertainty that came from those data. So we did a these we did a basically a data-informed uncertainty analysis. These are the extremes of our uncertainty based on that data uncertainty. And we find that many of our results are relatively robust to the underlying data uncertainty. For example, cell charge density is always the number one contributor. And so these estimates of the contributions of the low level mechanisms can help those who are conducting research into improving lithium ion batteries and designing new storage technologies. These suggest which characteristics we should focus on. But of course, not everyone involved in improving these batteries is going to walk into a lab tomorrow and say, you know what, I've got a great idea for improving the cathode material in your battery. Some people have different decisions to make, for example, in the design of public policy, the direction of investment. And this research approach can also inform their efforts. So often these policy and investment decisions are associated with what we call high level mechanisms of cost change research and development, learning by doing, economies of scale. And so we can return to that cost equation and we can assign each variable to the high level mechanism that likely influenced that low level mechanism. And with this, we can quantify the contribution of these high level mechanisms to cost reduction over time. And the results of this analysis are plotted here. We find that the largest contribution to cost reduction, 54%, came from public and private research and development. 
economies of scale provided the second largest contribution, about 30%, and learning by doing, meanwhile, contributed little. But of course, we were also interested in the uncertainty we might be introduced by making those assignments. So we examined otherwise extreme versions of plausible assignments, and we find that our ranking is generally robust in this uncertainty. R&D remains the primary contributor. Economies of scale typically uh, essentially uh, contribute less. But then one, one might say fairly, you know, public and private R&D is a very large category. Can you be a bit more specific? And we can disaggregate that contribution. And when we do, we find that most of the research and development can be attributed to advancements in chemistry and material science, which I am still You're using to describe. What? <laughs> You're happy about that. Yes, right? I am. <laughs> uh, but I am using it to also describe a broad swath of research, right? I had to come up with a phrase that we can use, but it's describing chemistry, chemical engineering, material synthesis, processing characterization, and mechanical engineering, right? It shows up in many disciplines. <coughs> and we find that these contributions are also not limited to just one component, right? We saw these contributions across the battery. And this in part reflects how different components could be improved and somewhat independently, and that there were many options to improve and combine them. So folks in one lab could be improving cathode materials, people in another lab could be improving anode materials, and these different electrode materials could still be combined to give a lithium ion cell without needing to reinvent how these batteries are being designed and manufactured and operated every time there was some improvement in one of the components. So now we want to think about the future. Based on our results, how can we inform further improvements for energy storage technologies while recognizing that past performance does not necessarily dictate the future? So here we're going to try to do something, not necessarily project where these batteries are going to go, but try to inform decisions about how to accelerate the improvement of batteries and other storage technologies. And so we think about the results of the research and the implications of these conclusions. So one conclusion was that the increase in cell charge density contributed substantially to cost decline. So one implication of this is that new battery chemistries should not focus solely on input prices. So if someone came to me tomorrow and said, you know what, Mike, I've got a great idea for a sodium ion battery. I'm going to use it for stationary storage, so I'm not going to care at all about the charge density or the energy density, and I can bring down the cost of the cathode material by 50%. I would say, you know, that sounds good. Is there a way you could do it without precluding an increase in that charge density or that energy density? Because we found that the increase in cell charge density was really important for the cost decline, the improvement of lithium ion batteries, and lithium ion and sodium ion batteries are just not that different question on that. Yes. Is there a theoretical limit on the charge density and are you kind of asymptotically close <laughs> to that limit or there is there still quite a lot of improvement potential? There? Theoretical limits are tough because you can come in and say thermodynamically here's your limit, here's your limit based on physics, thermodynamics, but then there are also chemical limits, right? Lithium cobalt oxide, the classic cathode material, um, you can only extract about half of the lithium before it decomposes, right? So like there are, I like to think of these chemical limits where it's like, yes, there is more lithium there, but if you took it out, the whole thing would fall apart, right? Thermodynamics doesn't necessarily, I mean, it does govern that, but like if you were to just say, how much lithium is there? That's not getting you the right answer. Um, so it is hard for me to say in particular whether we have reached limits because those limits depend on the different materials. And for all I know, there's a material that hasn't been tested and fully characterized through using these batteries yet. Um, but I, there is a paper which I think does a reasonably good job, which I can um, send you if you're interested in how close we are to these limits. Um, but I think they're also, you know, they're yeah, because that, that advice that you would give depends yeah. on how close we are to that limit. Yes, but I'm giving that advice to people in sodium ion batteries where they're just starting out, right? Uh. Um, and so they're, they might have much more way to go. But what the limit is going to be very chemistry and design dependent. And so it's hard for me to say, are we close to the limit? Because there are many limits depending on what chemistries you use and how you design a cell. Um, so an another big conclusion we came to was that public and private research and development can dominate cost reduction, even after the commercialization of a technology, while economies of scale contribute less. And this reflects the fact that lithium-ion batteries were commercially introduced in 1991. 
Our study examined a two decade period that started years later, the late 90s to the early 2010s. And during this period, we found that R&D was a primary contributor to cost decline. So one implication of this conclusion is that we want to maintain funding for R&D even after the commercial introduction of a technology. So maintain funding for public R&D efforts. But it is important to note, I should always, you know, that market expansion policies, policies that aim to you know, expand the market for, let's say, batteries, can contribute to private R&D. And but in, so it's important to remember that feedback loop. But in this case, it was public and private R&D that really dominated cost reduction for decades after the commercial introduction of the technology. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking about this, and I see this as like you're sort of measuring the benefits in a way of like what's causing these cost declines, but you don't necessarily have the cost of doing it, right? So public and private R&D could dominate the cost for reduction, but it could cost way more than developing economies of scale would. I'm wondering if there's a way to put a dollar value in any way to like how much is being spent on public and private R&D and how much is being spent on economies of scale and like which if I only had a dollar. Yeah, if I had a dollar and I needed to spend it on one or the other, which would that be better? I think there are some approaches where you could kind of do that yeah. um, in a perspective sense. Yeah. It's something that we, we should talk about. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think there there might be ways to estimate it based on certain what we know about the technology and where it might or might not be able to yeah. change if we do have good senses of the physical and the chemical in it. Um, but we didn't do that here. Um, and what is the status quo in the U.S.? So is it that <coughs> the commercial introduction, R&D spending dropped significantly, or does it actually stay from, by looking at your data, for example? Um, what can you say about that? Right now, we have a lot of both. We have a lot of R&D investments in battery technologies. You know, the vehicle technologies office has been working on this for a while and continues to. Um, there are also like material research efforts across the Department of Energy and NSF, a lot of which focus on that better battery materials. And we also have significant, essentially, market expansion policies coming from the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, um, you know, subsidizing the uh, essentially investment in these technologies. Um, so I would say the status quo is we, we're kind of look, we're doing both, um, and you know. How we balance that, I think, is a question that we need to continually address going forward. The technology is going to change, right? We've also done there. Some of my colleagues did a similar study for solar photovoltaics, and they showed that, and there they were able to split it into more time periods, right? I just looked between two time periods. They could split it up because it has a longer history, and they found that initially R and D was a bigger contributor, but then over time economies of scale kicked in. But in both cases, R and D remained a big contributor after the commercial introduction of the technology, which is when some people in the policy sphere would say, okay, it's commercially produced, let the market do the rest of the work, right? So this kind of adds some empirical evidence to the importance of R&D even after commercial introduction. So if we want to accelerate improvements, right? Keep funding that R&D. Um, but you can fund it both publicly and privately through direct and indirect mechanisms. So finally, we also found that Access to a diverse chemical space might have enabled batteries to improve rapidly. For example, the fact that researchers found ways to replace that cobalt and lithium cobalt dioxide with different mixtures of nickel, manganese, or cobalt, or just rely on lithium iron phosphate. And when they did this, they didn't need to reinvent how these batteries were designed and manufactured and operated every single time. You could almost think of the cathode materials as basically drop-in components. Access to this diversity might have enabled the rapid cost decline we observed. And so one implication of this is that investments, public and private again, should encourage the exploration of diverse chemistries and materials that can be combined in a modular design. And by modular here, I know there are many definitions, by he here I mean a technology that allows for the components to be improved without needing to be reinvented every time those components are improved. And so these are some of the, the key takeaways that we hope will inform efforts to accelerate the improvement of energy storage technologies. Of course, you know, I should acknowledge the people who I worked on this with. I did a lot of this work with Professor Jessica Transek at uh, MIT and uh, Joe Song and a few other colleagues I'm currently working with on a variety of other projects. And we were funded by the Sloan Foundation, MIT Office of Sustainability, MIT Portugal to complete some of this work and related work. 
that I described. So I'm happy to take any more questions people have, of course. Yeah. Does your research reveal where there might be a um, benefit to uh, exploring different manufacturing technologies between stationary and transportation oriented batteries? Because right now it's basically one method of manufacturing that goes into either transportation or stationary storage. For the most part. Yeah, we, we haven't looked in particular at that question. It's an interesting question. In some of the earlier work, right, where I described how we found that the rates of improvement were much higher when we considered that they improved along multiple dimensions. One thing that might say about stationary storage, right, stationary storage, we're not as worried about energy density. It's important, but it's not as important as just really low cost. Um, one would say, you know, it might be we will see faster improvement in that direction as people, you know, that part of the community shifts away from worrying about energy density, it's just like, let's get to those low costs. So the fact that we see greater improvement when we look at these two important metrics over time suggests that stationary storage, you know, options, we might see faster improvement there. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't know if anyone, people have proposed new designs for cells designed for stationary storage. I, don't want to say no one's done it because I don't know everyone, but I haven't seen someone proposing manufacturing technology specifically for stationary storage. They do design the cells differently, and they also rely on different chemistries already. So they're kind of using the tools that we have to already customize the cells for stationary applications. There's a question there on the screen. Oh, there's a question. The chat. Why batteries have low learning by doing rates compared to other renewable technologies? Is that because they're still less standardized? And how will battery recycling increase the cost dynamic? Will be there additional room for cost decrease? Good question. Um, we found that batteries had actually, when you considered their improvement along multiple dimensions, that lithium ion batteries had actually learning rates that were pretty high compared to other renewable technologies, actually pretty much on almost on par with solar photovoltaics, which kind of has not one of the highest learning rates for energy technologies. Um, so we didn't find them to be especially low. If you're referring to batteries in general, um, you know, different battery technologies have had different drivers and different characteristics that make them more or less amenable to the type of improvement that we saw with lithium ion batteries. So um, I wouldn't be able to, you know, they, again, the answer is it depends. Um, in terms of battery recycling, uh, that's a very good question. You know, battery recycling is something I'm actually very interested in now, as well as many of my colleagues. And, you know, there are questions about what role it will play. Um, one of the big takeaways, though, is it will play a role, not a huge amount in the immediate or near term. And that's because there's a lag between when we make a battery and when we recycle a battery, right? If we put a bunch of batteries into a car, Ideally, that car is going to last a while and not need to replace those batteries for a couple of years, maybe a decade, maybe more. And so the materials we're putting into cars today aren't going to be available for recycling for a while. And so the impact of battery recycling on those cost dynamics is not going to be huge until we start using lots and lots of recycled material. But we're going to have increasing demand for EVs and increasing demand for battery materials and increasing demand for stationary storage. Again, increasing demand for battery material. And that's going to probably outpace recycling because of this lag or the impact of recycling because of this lag. Other questions. What's the outlook on battery recycling feasibility, not just technically, but economically? Being answered, yes. Um, storage capacity for the energy grid. Um, so, there have been lots of estimates of the how much storage capacity we need. Um, the amount of storage capacity is really sensitive to certain assumptions that one makes about the grid, right? How much are we going to rely on, you know, nuclear power? How much are we going to rely on expanding transmission? How much are we going to rely on, you know, existing hydro or building new natural gas with CCS? Um, so it's really hard to pin down uh, how much battery capacity we might need on the grid. There's some really good estimates out there. 
Um, but also those estimates are in turn dependent on our assumptions of how much these technologies might cost, right? So, you know, if you're going to say, well, we're going to compare batteries versus natural gas, right? If they have different cost dynamics over time, your results can be very different, um, especially when you start seeing compounding cost dynamics, right? When you start putting these learning rates into the exponent of a power law, that makes a big difference when you start compounding that over a year, just like compound interest, right? Um, in, in a similar mathematical sense. And so it's, it is difficult for me to say this is how much storage capacity we might need because it depends so much on uh, different characteristics. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you go back to that slide where you showed all the um, different factors that you looked at. I don't like the ones that impact it, that have like kind of, yeah, this slide. Yep, this slide. Oh, my back too far. Sorry. Two, yeah, this one. We'll show it with the error bars. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering, like, um, <coughs> did, I don't know if this would be a big influence for batteries. I was just wondering, like, um, if you thought about how, I don't know, like any, any types of, like, federal funding released towards R&D in this area or any types of, I guess, political changes, policy changes that could have affected this? Like, I don't know how much, for example, you know, renew incentives for using renewables have actually driven technology development in that area. But um, yeah, I'm just wondering like if that's taken, if that's thought about here, if, you're, if it's just looking at it is something we absolutely things. considered, right? I would have liked to be able to say, you know, of this R&D contribution, for example, this much came from private dollars and this much came from public dollars. That's really tough to do for this technology. I'm not going to say I'll never be able to do it, but at the time when I was working on this, it just didn't seem to be the data. And part of the challenge here is that a lot of lithium-ion battery manufacturing for years was really pushed a lot by essentially the private sector, right? Mm -hmm. These batteries became very popular in consumer electronics. People wanted cell phones that lasted longer. Um, they wanted, you know, laptops that were thinner. That, you know, every time, like, people used to be like, this thing lasts six hours on a charge. This thing lasts 12 hours on a single charge. Um, and, you know, at, at, after a certain point, you get to the point where people plug it in every night, and they kind of stopped touting that. But they still do for technology. So there was a lot of private sector interest in improving this and efforts. Um, and also the public sector research, there's a question of like, when do you stop, right? Do we go all the way back to early, early research? I'm like, one could say, you know, what's the role of the, the in discovery of lithium as an independent element? Like, you kind of have that question of, if we're gonna look at, you know, the R&D, where do you start and stop? And of course we can make decisions and see how public sector funding back to that point in time or that point in, you know, the history of science played a role. Um, but getting information from the companies as to how much they invested in R&D can make this a very difficult proposition. Yeah. Uh, I had a quick question. One, sure. I wanted to follow up on whatever someone mentioned about feasibility with regards to uh, battery recycling. Yeah. And then secondly, the global ecosystem because, you know, we're not in a vacuum. Sure. Their contributions, I'm sure, especially in solar from China and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Where would you think that America fits into that? In particular, like you mentioned Massachusetts, New England, and Texas. Those are deregulated markets. So from what I've observed in those markets, there's a razor thin margins and they don't have a lot of extra margin to invest in particular battery technology and so on and so forth. So I was really curious about that. Sure, yeah, so I mean, we, we are actually seeing a lot of batteries being installed along with solar projects in California and Texas. Um, they have lots of installation um, of these renewable energy technologies, not just batteries, but like, you know, Texas has lots of solar and wind being installed. Um, this is in part because, you know, and the reason I highlighted them is they have really good resource potential for both of them. Uh, Texas is an example of good solar and good wind resource potential. Massachusetts I highlight because it's the challenging case, right? I talked about the challenge. It's below solar and low wind resource potential, offshore wind accepted. Uh, 
So, you know, in terms of the role of the United States, right, I don't know if I need to say what the role of it should be. We can say what the role of it is. We have massive amounts of subsidies on the table for these technologies, right? The, the, you know, we have residential energy tax credit. We have, uh, you know, major investment tax credits for some of these technologies. We have, you know, EV policies that are, will subsidize the purchase of EVs, but only if the batteries are being made in the U.S. We have direct subsidies, like a certain number of dollars per kilowatt hour at the cell level and at the module level for energy storage technologies. Um, so, I mean, I think the U.S. is putting a lot of money into improving these technologies. Um, and so, you know, that might then contribute to how companies view their internal R&D, their internal, you know, essentially manufacturing efforts, even despite margins. Uh, it's also, the batteries are especially complicated because the margins can be different depending on what the battery is being used for, right? Um, you know, the very thin, lightweight batteries that go into cell phones and portable electronics might be more, they, they're different than the ones we put into cars, and those are different than the ones we put into stationary storage, albeit less of a difference there. But like that differentiation also makes the market a little bit more complicated and can mean that companies can have different margins on different types of batteries. What do you think would happen if we didn't introduce any more storage into the stationary system? Just, I'm thinking like uh, a, a tree has adapted to very limited uh, resources, right? You grow sure. fat in a uh, and it grows thin in a so, I mean, how, how would our system respond? Yeah, what do you think would happen? I mean, the, the, where, where would the uh, uh, innovation go? It's not going into storage. So I mean, those are different questions. How will the system respond versus where will the innovation go? They might actually have the same answer. Um, we see that I mean, we can actually do that. You know, in a, in a, I would say somewhat crude, maybe not crude, in a, um, in a focused sense, in the study that we I talked about in the first half of this talk. Because the, in essence, you know, let's cut down on the amount of storage we add. Let's just increase the storage cost. See what happens to the rest of the system, right? Um, you see increasing building of solar and wind, for example, right? Maybe you know you would uh, your day is partly cloudy. Fifty percent of the sun you would typically get. Um, you can either make that up with a battery or install twice as many solar panels, and you still get your hundred percent, right? So there's this trade-off between installing storage and installing more renewables capacity. Um, won't work on a day when there's no sun, and it won't work at nighttime, but we've got wind, right? There's some complementarity there. There's also expanding transmission. So, you know, there are multiple ways. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to make that decision. Storage is getting installed in massive scale. Um, but then, you know, I would say innovation would follow. Like, if all of a sudden, no more storage, not loud, then, you know, you would probably see more people investing in solar panels and wind turbines, not just to install them, but then to improve them even more. Um, same things with expanding transmission. There would be greater efforts there, um, building backup power options, you know, which might involve natural gas with CCS or um, you know, geothermal. People are looking, there's been a renewed effort to bring down the cost of geothermal and maybe use geothermal in a more flexible fashion. Um, so I would say, you know, there are a diversity of technologies here, and if one were stopped, I would say the system would adapt by focusing on the other technology options. Demand side, too. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Demand side. I, I shouldn't omit demand side, uh, but I was, I was thinking of the generation side. But yeah, absolutely. Um, demand side options are a big part of this. Well, thank you so much. Sure. This has been very insightful. Thank you for having me.